All right, so welcome to Math 383 Complex Analysis. You know, we're at the final lectures. What I want to do today is talk about one of the big applications of complex analysis, which is in calculating eigenvalues, which are used to model a variety of different things. Now, I believe we had a very quick introduction to eigenvalues of matrices um, earlier in the semester, yes? We talked a little bit about that. And I want to go into a little bit more detail because this gives a sense of some of the projects I do with my small students. I do things more on the number theory side, but it's very similar questions and sometimes similar techniques. Um, hopefully everybody remembers what eigenvalues are. You know, AV equals lambda V, V is not zero. Yes? And the way you find them is the determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero. Yes, you've seen this. Now, in the real world, uh, you should be shot if you are using the determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero for large matrices. You know, computationally, this is a nightmare. Right? But theoretically, it's wonderful. You know, theoretically, that's what we're doing. But if you actually have to compute the damn stuff, you would never want to do something like that. Uh, if you've never heard of Gershgorin circle theorem, I'm assuming most people have not heard of that. I will just leave the slide over here and let you look at that at your leisure later. It's an interesting way to find some information about where the eigenvalues have to be <laughs> as a function of the matrix elements. And it's just something that you should be aware of. I always forget exactly how to spell Gershgorin, but I know close enough how to spell it that the web is able to take whatever spelling I've attempted and direct me to this there. All right. So, um, just a quick, quick review of matrices. I'm assuming everybody has seen transpose. You take the matrix and the columns become rows and the rows become columns. If the matrix equals its transpose and the entries are real, we say it's real symmetric. Now, the analog of this is the complex conjugate transpose. So we take the complex conjugate of the matrix and then take the transpose. We sometimes use the letter H to note this operation. So this is the Hermitian of the matrix. It's the complex conjugate transpose. All right. Um, has everybody seen stuff like this in linear algebra? Yes. OK. And then if we have some vector in Cn, then its norm, or its norm squared, is the complex conjugate transpose times the vector. If the vector was real, this is essentially the dot product. Why do we have to take the complex conjugate transpose? Well, if I give you the vector v equals one i, and I just do the normal dot product, the dot product of two vectors, you can write it as v transpose v. Well, I would get one i, one i, one squared plus i squared, that's zero. And we don't want a vector to have a length of zero unless it happens to be the zero vector. This is the great uniqueness question we've been talking about and skirting the issue a little bit. You know, if I have a function whose Fourier transform is zero, wouldn't it be wonderful to know it's the zero function? You know, we want to be able to invert. And so we would want the only thing that has zero length to be the zero vector. Well, if I use something like just the normal dot product, that will not necessarily be the case. But if we take the complex conjugate transpose, now you would get one minus i, one and i, and you get one squared minus i squared, which is two. So its length is the square root of two. And this is quite reasonable. If you graph the vector one i, you can see I'm going at a 45 degree angle. The base and the height are both one. Okay, yes, this is the one, one root two triangle. One of the most famous triangles of all, right? Okay. The next one is hopefully you've seen that if I give you a matrix with real entries, the eigenvalues don't necessarily have to be real. So the best example is a rotation matrix. So R of theta, is rotating by theta. Now, I have no advanced physicists here, because sometimes there's a dispute as to do you rotate the coordinate axes or do you rotate the points? Where do you put the minus sign in the matrix? Do you put the minus sign in the upper right or the bottom left? We will just put it in the upper right today. So this is going to be rotating by theta radians. And if you think about it, Let's say we choose a value of theta between zero and two pi. Do you expect there to be a real eigenvector? Do you expect there to be a matrix V such that R theta of V is V? 
If V is a real, why not? Because I get vectors to just scale up and down. Yeah, it has to just, right. It has to have the same direction. And here I'm rotating the vector by theta radius. Is there any value of theta between zero and two pi where your direction would be unchanged? I'm sorry? Zero and I said between zero and two okay. pi. <laughs> pi. So if I rotate by pi radians, it's actually just rescaling the vector by negative one. So if you take a rotation by negative pi, then yes, you can have a real eigenvalue, um, a real eigenvector. But that's the only case. It, it makes sense that if I'm rotating, in general, the direction is not going to be the same because I'm physically changing the direction. The only time that's not going to be the case, the only time when I'm going to be in the same direction is if I don't do anything. So I'm rotating by 0 to pi. Or if I rotate by pi, so I'm just multiplying by negative 1. We've proven the fundamental theorem of algebra in this class. So again, for the final week of topics, I'm trying to choose things that allow me to review all the material we've been doing throughout the semester. What is the fundamental theorem of algebra state? <laughs> so if I give you a degree n polynomial with complex coefficients, it has n exactly n complex roots with multiplicity. Um, you could even say it has one root because then by you, know, you can just hack away. I find it interesting that I'm going to be teaching algebra next semester, and I can't get to the fundamental theorem of algebra, but I can get to it in complex analysis. So if I give you a matrix, well, to find the determinant, to find the eigenvalues, I look at the determinant of a minus lambda i, that's a polynomial, I'm going to have n eigenvalues. But I don't necessarily have n real eigenvectors. So even if I'm looking at something just in the plane, to understand it, it becomes useful to shift to the complex plane. So this is a real fundamental uh, fact that you just have to grasp. For a lot of things in mathematics, even if you only care about reals or the integers, it is beneficial to shift to the complex plane. You've hopefully experienced a little bit of this with calculus. You know, calculus has a lot of powerful tools. And even if I only care about things at the integers, it's often nice to shift to a continuous analog and have the tools of calculus available. We saw that when we tried to estimate n factorial. And we used, you know, we proved Stirling's formula. And the idea was rather than looking at this discrete function on the integers, we had this continuous function. We had powerful tools and techniques that we could apply to this. Okay. So who here has at least seen this theorem? If your matrix is complex summation, so it equals its complex conjugate transpose, then its eigenvalues are real. How many of you have seen this? How many of you do not remember seeing this? How many of you could prove this right now if your life depended on it? Okay, it's good that my hand is up because um, I'm about to try to give the proof. Okay, this is a fact that you should know. Uh, it is not always you know, covered in linear algebra. I will say some things when we are not being recorded. All right, so proof. And so a lot of these calculations all come down to trying to consider the right quantity, this divine inspiration. So we know that A equals AH. We somehow want to use that. And so we're going to consider VHV. That would be the length of V, right? And I'm going to put an A in between. And rather than putting an A in between, what else could I put in? A. Right, yeah. So, you know, again, it, it's you want to say A star, do you want to say H? There's lots of different ways of saying it. All right. So this is the same as VH with AV. And this is the same as AV, take the complex conjugate transpose acting on V. And now we're assuming... A V equals lambda V. So then we would get V H lambda V equals lambda V Hermitian V. Well, this is just lambda V Hermitian V. And now when I bring the lambda outside, what happens when I bring the lambda outside? It becomes lambda bar. So we get lambda bar 
VHV. So we get lambda times the length of V squared equals lambda bar times the length of V squared. As the length of V is not zero, that implies lambda equals lambda bar, which implies lambda is real. So this is an extremely valuable result. Okay. So the eigenvalues of complex Hermitian matrices are real. What about the eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices? What can you tell me about them? Maybe. What can you tell me about the eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices? Well, they have to be real. They have to be real. Why? Because that's a special case. Of Good. So it's a special case. So I could actually do this whole proof again, replacing all the H's with T's. Yes or no? Yes. So if I just use a transpose, I would not be getting a lambda bar here. That's one issue. So you would actually get lambda equals lambda. Yes. You don't. We don't know that V transpose V is not zero. Just because the eigenvalues are real does not necessarily mean the corresponding eigenvector is real. So we can't just replace all of the H's with T's. But because any real symmetric matrix is also complex Hermitian, the result holds because they're a special subset. So the eigenvalues of real matrices are real. The eigenvalues of complex Hermitian matrices are real. You can ask, what's the most general class of matrices that have real eigenvalues? And it's a nice you know, question to investigate. One of the first extra credit uh, questions in the semester was to show that you can't put an order on the complex numbers. So you can't find a way to compare any two complex numbers such that if x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z. If, however, your quantities are real, we have an ordering. And so for a lot of things in physics, it's great if your eigenvalues are real because you can now talk about ordering things. You can talk about space and statistics. So I could look at energy levels of heavy nuclei, and each energy level is going to be a different eigenvalue of you know, some operator. OK. So as I remarked, eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices are real, and we can talk about ordering. And then as a nice exercise, try to think, what is the largest class of matrix you can find where the eigenvalues have to be real? It might be the complex emission, but maybe there's something even bigger. OK. How many people remember unitary and orthogonal matrices? Okay, so I am very glad that I have decided to do a review here. Um, and again, this is nothing against how the class was taught. There is just too much material to do in one semester of linear algebra. And you have to make choices. You know, when I teach abstract algebra in the spring, uh, I am going to be inspired by getting ready for cryptography. To me, a lot of the purpose of abstract algebra is to develop the tools so that we can attack crypto systems. But there's other approaches you can do for abstract algebra, which is perfectly fine. You can do geometry of groups. That's absolutely fine. Uh, here, I really care about eigenvalues because of your know, applications in physics. So orthogonal matrices, think of these as rotations. Does the universe care which way we orient our coordinate axes? So I see several people shaking their heads. So you can prove to me that the universe does not care. If anyone is able to give a proof of that, I would love to see it. I, that is outside what I am allowed to do in a math department. Right? That is outside what I will discuss confidently. I don't think the universe cares. I will act as if the universe doesn't care. When I'm trying to create my physics, I really don't think things should depend on how I orient my coordinate axis. And again, you know, this is a chance to just go over some things you've hopefully seen in other classes. When you write down a matrix, a matrix is a transformation. Depending on what basis you use to represent the inputs and the outputs, the same transformation will look very different. This is the whole purpose. Uh, have you done the principal axis theorem? You know, for real symmetric matrix, 
it has an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. I can switch to Greek if this would make things easier. Actually, my Greek is not so good. Um, so the whole point is that if we change variables, we can often make problems easier. So let me shift down, down a little bit. Um, and I think we've talked a little bit about this before. If I give you an ellipse oriented along the coordinate axes, I assume everybody is comfortable. This is just x over a squared plus y over b squared equals one. A better way to view, whoa, a better way to view this is I take this matrix, one over a squared, zero, zero, one over b squared, and basically sandwich that between my vector and its transpose. If I give you an ellipse, but now it's no longer aligned with the coordinate axes, oops, bless you. then what it's saying is, well, look, why don't you choose a better coordinate system where it's aligned? And then in that better coordinate system, in that UV system, we would have you know, UV, one over A squared, zero, zero, one over B squared, UV equals one. And now, how do I get from UV to XY? Rotation. So um, I can then say, and UV is some rotation matrix XY. And so you would get XY Q transpose, and I'll just call that matrix A Q XY equals one. Where this is my matrix A. And this is how you would write down the general equation of an ellipse, you know, if it's not aligned with the coordinate axis. It's just change your coordinate system so that things are nice, solve it there, and then rotate back. So again, it's much nicer if I have the matrix that has you know, half of its entries zero, and I just have non-zero entries along the main diagonal. It's very easy to see what's going on. You know, what does this matrix do? It rescales the x component by one over a squared, it rescales the y component by one over b squared. In this more involved one over here, this q transpose aq, this is all meshed together. It's much harder to just look at this and see what's going on. But it's the same transformation. It's just represented differently. And so the whole point of uh, what's going on here is we want to understand what happens to eigenvalues if we rotate our coordinate axis. Well, so matrix is orthogonal if Q transpose Q equals Q, Q transpose equals the identity. Have people seen, has anyone here not seen orthogonal matrices? So everyone here has at least seen orthogonal. Has everybody here seen unitary? This is the, okay, so unitary is the complex analog. So. Orthogonal is I have real entries and each row has length one and each row is perpendicular to every other row. And if you don't like rows and you prefer columns, fine. Each column has length one and each column is perpendicular to each column. And the reason is if you're an orthogonal matrix, so is your transpose. So a unitary matrix is just the complex analog of a orthogonal matrix. And so now I want each row to have length one. Well, that means not just the sum of the squares, but the sum of the absolute value of the squares. And I want each row to be perpendicular to each other row. And so now I just have to remember that I have to take the complex conjugate of one of the two vectors when I'm taking the dot box. So unitary matrices are just generalizations. It turns out the eigenvalues of unitary matrices are of the form e to the i theta. Is e to the i theta, is that always going to be real? No. Can I order the eigenvalues, however? Yes. So now I have a nice parameter theta. And again, it's not stated here, but um, theta is real. If theta was not real, this would be a stupid statement. Right? If I allowed theta to be complex, then OK. So you're saying the eigenvalues are numbers. Wonderful. OK. Has anybody seen a proof that unitary matrices have eigenvalues of absolute value one. 
Okay, so again, not too many. So let's do a proof of this. So the proof is again divine inspiration. So what did we do before? Before we looked at VH, V, and we put in an A in between. We put in an A because we knew A equals A Hermitian. Okay. Again, what I really want you to get out of today's lecture is how should we look at problems like this? You know, these are the geometry problems. You know, if I give you all the details, you're competent mathematicians, you can follow them line by line. But it's this divine inspiration. How did someone see to draw the auxiliary line? How did someone see to do this? But we've seen now that you know, I take A and AH and I put them between VH and V because they're the same. So if, you, if you've seen the proof before, don't speak up now. What should we do? So I'll have, you know, VHV. What should I put in between? I'm sorry? So what should UHU. Let's try that. So we might not even need to do anything for the other one. I'm sorry? Well, let's think about what's going on. So we might not even need to do anything here. And we'll, here we'll assume uv equals lambda v. Maybe we put in u, uh. That would definitely be something reasonable to try. And again, I'm quite happy to try something and have it not work as long as something works eventually. Part of it is I want us to build up a repertoire of things to try. You know, this is the baby is crying. Let's go through a bunch of things and figure out what can we do. Well, let's start to analyze. How would you analyze VHUHUV? Yes. Okay, so we split into two. So this would be VHUH times uv. And now what can we do? Yeah. So this is uv permission uv. And so this becomes lambda v, lambda v, and there's a permission here. So this becomes lambda bar lambda v permission v. Yeah. So this is just V Hermitian V as U Hermitian U equals I. So really, over here, it's not U U H that I should put in. What should I put in here? I'm really just putting an I because that that's really what that's really what's going on. It's not the U H U goes to U U H. It's that U H U is the identity. And that's the two things that are equal. And so that's how it's more similar to what we've done before. So we know that this is just V H V. So we get that the absolute value of lambda squared times the length of V squared is the length of V squared as the length of V squared is not zero. That implies the length of lambda equals one, which implies lambda is e to the i theta. And there's a proof that if I have a unitary operator, its eigenvalues are going to be of the form e to the i theta. What if, so I did this for unitary matrices. What about orthogonal matrices? What do we know about the eigenvalues of orthogonal matrices? So one possibility is negative one and one. What's the weakest statement? Or what, what statement do you know must be true about the eigenvalues of orthogonal matrices? Absolute value it's a number. Absolute value, one. absolute value one. Why is it absolute value one? Special case. So because orthogonal matrices are a special case of unitary matrices, 
we know that immediately the eigenvalues of um, orthogonal matrices have to be of absolute value one. Then the next question is, do they have to be real? And then you can go and you can look at rotation matrices and see would the rotation matrices have real eigenvalues? And that would be a great place to start building up um, some intuition. Okay, next result, the eigenvalue trace lemma. The sum of the eigenvalues of a matrix is equal to the sum of the diagonal entries. How many people remember seeing this in linear algebra? How many people could prove it if their life depended on it? Okay, how, how does the proof go? Mm -hmm. find the values, and you just expand everything, and then the last term will be like the sum of the. It's just like so. Then you need to develop the theory of, of the characteristic polynomial. Are there any matrices where it will be easy to prove this? Diagonal. Diagonal. So trivial. If A is diagonal as the eigenvalues are the diagonal entries. So if our matrix is diagonal, it's trivial. Is every matrix diagonal? Can every matrix be converted to, to diagonal? So one thing to note is the trace of S inverse AS is the trace of AS S inverse is the trace of A. And so if I do some nice transformations of my matrix, I'm not going to affect things like the trace. Not every matrix can be diagonalized, unfortunately. Can anybody give me a matrix that cannot be diagonalized? So, so you know, one one zero one cannot be diagonalized. Yep. So, not every matrix can be diagonalized. So, you could maybe try to argue, well, okay, maybe not every matrix can be diagonalized. But what if I were to disturb ever so slightly this matrix? Would it be diagonalizable? Yes, and then this result would be true. And then would this, and so if I have this equality, would the equality then continue to hold in the limit as I return to my original matrix? So you could try to prove it that way and try to make this rigorous. That one way to determine if a matrix is diagonalizable is if it has N distinct eigenvalues, then it's diagonalizable. So if I give you a matrix, almost surely the matrix has distinct eigenvalues, so you're fine. If the matrix has repeated eigenvalues, then what you have to do is you have to just tweak the matrix a little bit so that you no longer have a repeated eigenvalue. The question is, how do you do that? And you know, can you make a rigorous way for that to happen? It should hold. And then you should have this result which is true. Or maybe we can try to use maybe an accumulation argument that I know this is true for a large class, so it should be true, although the eigenvalues become these complicated functions. Not every matrix can be diagonalized, but every matrix can be. There is drawn in canonical form, uh, which is great, but there's actually something that's easier to work with than drawn in canonical form. Of a triangle. So, so every matrix can be put into oops, into upper triangular form and trivially true there. Now, if I have A and say Q transpose AQ, Bless you. If we have, if we have 
a v equals lambda v, what do you think the eigenvalue might be of the eigenvector might be that corresponds to v of q transpose a q? Anybody give me a vector that should probably be an eigenvector of this? We know a v equals lambda v. I claim that you can find the eigenvectors of Q transpose AQ in a very nice way. Any guesses on what would be the corresponding eigenvector? What would go with V? I'm sorry? So if we take uh, QV, then you would have Q transpose AQ, QV. You're close. Q transpose. So if I do it like this, then I get Q transpose A, Q, Q transpose V. Well, what's Q, Q transpose? It's the identity. So then this just becomes lambda. I can bring that out, Q transpose V. And so the eigenvector of A and Q transpose AQ is potentially different, but the eigenvalue is the same. And so you can actually show that the eigenvalues are left unchanged when I rotate my coordinate systems, when I go from A to Q transpose AQ. So if I want to convert something to upper triangular form, I'm not going to really change the eigenvalues. And I'm not going to change the trace. So all you have to do is you have to prove that every matrix can be brought into upper triangular form. And from that, now we have everything. So this turns out to be an extremely powerful result. If instead of looking at you know, the trace of A, if we looked at the trace of A to the K, then you would have the eigenvalues to the K power. Or the trace of A, or I guess I used K as a subscript, or the trace of A to the M, you would have the eigenvalues to the Mth power. Okay. And so the reason that this is useful is let's say we want to understand the eigenvalues lambda one to lambda N. And this is a general problem in mathematics. There's something that you want to understand that's a function of the things that you can actually work with. So I can work with the matrix elements and I want to somehow pass from knowledge of the matrix elements to knowledge of the eigenvalues. If I give you a two by two matrix, is it easy to write down the eigenvalues? Yeah, you, what, what do you have to do to do this? Yeah, you have to solve a quadratic. You know, This is a graduate level class, solving a quadratic, that's not a problem. What if I give you a three by three matrix? There is a formula for the cubic. We can use that. If I give you a four by four matrix, there's a formula for the quarter. Unfortunately, once you get to degree five and higher, we no longer have closed form expressions for the eigenvalues as functions of the matrix elements. And things become much, much harder. The idea here is that if I understand maybe all the powers of the eigenvalues, I should hopefully be able to invert from that to get the eigenvalues. So this is the general hope. You know, if I give you one number, is it hard to find that number? No, if I give you the sum of two numbers, can you tell me what those two numbers are? No, but if I give you the sum of two numbers and the sum of the squares of those two numbers, then the hope is I've got two equations and two unknowns. I should be able to determine those numbers. If I have three numbers, and if I give you the sums of their first powers, second powers, and third powers, then the hope is that that should be enough to determine the three numbers. And that's essentially what's going on over here, is that if we have an n by n matrix, the hope is that if we know the first n moments, then that will be enough to determine the eigenvalues. OK. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about a specific paper. Uh, I'm just putting this up here uh, just so that it's actually on the, I guess I don't need to do this, okay. So that if anybody is watching this video, they don't actually have to go and click on the paper. This is the part of the paper that actually uses the complex analysis. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to just switch.